Welcome to another edition of RCE. Again, this is Brock Palin. You can find us online at rce-cast.com. You can find an RSS feed and a link to subscribe in iTunes and all the old shows on there. Um, I think some of the podcatchers only show a couple back. All of the old shows, all 70 plus of them, are available online there. Also, I have here Jeff Squires from Cisco Systems and one of the authors of Open MPI, Jeff. Hey, Brock, sounds like we're getting close to 100. We're, we're only 20-some uh, away, right? Yeah, yeah, we're getting there. Amazing that we've been doing this that long. I didn't even realize that. <laughs> yeah. Well, we have lots of good stuff to talk about in the future, but today uh, we have a, a guest from uh, Purdue. We actually have uh, two Purdue people in a, in a row on here. Uh, we have Gerhard Klemek, uh um, from Purdue, and he's going to talk to us about Hub Zero and Nano Hub. So, Gerhard, why don't you take a moment to uh, introduce yourself? Okay, so uh, you heard my name, Gerhard Klimek. I'm a professor of electrical engineering at Purdue. I'm also director of the Network for Computational Nanotechnology, which um, created Nano Hub and operates Nano Hub as a national infrastructure. And uh, we also spun out Hub Zero to enable other folks to uh, to spin out their own hubs and, and disseminate simulation technologies to other audiences. So Hub Zero is like the base package and yeah. Nano Hub's like, okay, so what is Hub Zero? So Hub Zero, you can think of it as um, a, a portal infrastructure, if you like the word portal, or a science gateway infrastructure, if you uh, like it that way. Uh, the goal is to uh, enable researchers um, uh, or other folks that might have simulation tools uh, to enable them to disseminate uh, these tools uh, to a much broader audience, sort of like cloud computing, where the end users really don't have to install anything, but it's um, it's really like a, a cloud computing environment that's end-to-end -end from a user's perspective, and it's powered by research tools uh, that come fresh out of research so it's it's geared towards um, uh, more rapidly disseminating knowledge and access to simulation tools and so what's the relationship then between hub zero and, and nano hub because i think you said in the beginning that the nano hub came first right right so um so uh the relationship is such that we we basically as we developed nano uh, nano hub and developed its infrastructure um uh, we realized this is really powerful and can help many other fields of science and we we sort of spun out in a sense the um the software stack the middleware um that uh, uh is sort of the framework that holds simulation tools, that holds the collaboration environments, it holds the user support aspects, uh, but it's it's basically an empty hub. So Hub Zero is the the infrastructure uh, which uh, is open source. You can download it from hubzero.org and um, uh, install it yourself, and you can spin out your own hub, and then you have to fill it in, fill it with content. So as such. Uh, over the years, we, we created an infrastructure group at Purdue that's now focused on uh, Hub Zero development and deployment. And Nano Hub is kind of like the, the granddaddy of it. And, and in, a, in a business sense, it's the biggest customer or partner to the Hub Zero uh, development team. So just curious, what's the software license of Hub Zero? Um, Boy, it's it is truly open source. It it basically embeds the labs uh, web st uh, stack, and I think it is uh, LGPL or it's BSD. I don't remember which one of the uh, the two it is, but it's of that flavor. So take it, um, use it, um, and uh, y you can put in your own uh, material, and you don't have to commit the changes. Um, or make your own source publicly available. So so it's of that open source flavor. Does that... I'd have to look it up. I'm sorry. So there's lots of different uh, portal systems out there and, and such, and a lot of places get by with things just like you know, MediaWiki installs for sharing information back and forth. What's some of the unique things about Hub Zero and maybe some of the things you've done on NanoHub that you really think is kind of like 
you know, That's, this is unique for our, our, our industry. Um, so uh, what I would say is that m most science gateways or portals um, are a little bit m like what you have or expect out of a, what you get at your bank, right? You you log in on a remote portal, you fill in out some, some little tags, you push uh, run or get me the query and you get some data back. And in general, it's it's more or less data in a raw form that's not very much graphically um, uh, represented. Typically, if it's graphics, it's like GIF images or something. Um, either way, it would be hard to really truly interact with this data that comes out of this query or comes out of that that simulation of that computer program. So what's what's really unique is that we basically run a full-fledged simulation tool or tool sets, uh, real graphical user interfaces in a, uh, that were developed in a Unix-type framework, um, uh, and we pipe that into the user's uh, browser via VNC-type technology. So it's, it's truly interactive uh, tools, and they run as if they were running on your local machine, but they're uh, remote. Um, and the user doesn't have to install anything and doesn't have to put into place the connectivity to grids, etc. So it's the interactivity um, that that's I think unique. Uh, so you said you said something very interesting there, though. So when I was doing a little research before this, when I was playing with some of the simulations on um, NanoHub, I just kind of assumed they were JavaScripty kinds of things. But you said mm. they're more like VNC kinds of things. So are they running back on your back end servers, and you're doing a VNC like view in my that, browser? That's exactly it. So so basically, you have a VNC view into a virtual. Unix machine uh, that runs an X11 type environment. Um, and we can host any X11 Linux based tool in this environment. And uh, the front end might run in this virtual machine. Also, the, the computation, if it's lightweight enough, might run in that virtual machine. Or it might get dispatched into some bigger machine. Uh, pending the required resources or depending on the required resources. Um, so it looks like a thin uh, or like a Java applet in a sense. And the only thing that's Java about it right now is it's the VNC client that runs on your machine. The rest really runs on the back end and, and, and possibly on a even further remote back end on a parallel computer. Um, if if some, some codes require some 200 cores on on three four hours or some of the simulation tools run in seconds so i think that that's the unique piece and, and the origin really of these tools is the unique piece interesting can, can you give us some specific examples of simulations and tools that people can use sure so um, one of the earlier ones was um, a tool called Nanowire, very creative name, right? You can imagine that it models a nanowire uh, or electron flow through very small wires. And that was a PhD thesis work that in typical academic fashion would, of course, be getting very dusty virtually on some, some DVD backup system or some tape backup system and nobody would be able to use it. Um, we have developed a technology called Rapture that uh, allows us to put user interfaces on top of these tools really rapidly within a few weeks and then deploy this research code to a broader community. Um, so, so there's two novel aspects to that. Number one, it's, it's codes that normally would be condemned to nothingness, and we put a second life on them. Uh, two, the user interfaces are rather friendly. You don't have to read a 200-page manual before you can operate this tool. Um, so so that would be one tool. There's another tool maybe um, uh, we have a donation from uh, former Bell Labs uh, that uh, where we can host their device simulation tool, how they design their, um, their semiconductor chips. And you can run the tool raw, meaning with a 
gobbledygook in input language that's hard to use or you can have a, a sort of derived versions that have very easy to use interfaces so it, these tools then can then be used in classes that teach maybe PN junctions or MOSFET transistors and things of that nature so suddenly these tools that were condemned to expert use become uh, uh, rapidly being used in classrooms and by experimental researchers that normally wouldn't touch it now, a follow-up question on one of the things you said earlier that, you know, uh, some old dusty academic code or something might have been condemned to death, but now you're giving it new life in, inside of a virtual machine. Does that mean you are you have a couple of different types of virtual machines, perhaps one with older operating systems that were required for some of these codes? Um, we actually don't do that right now. Pretty much all our uh, virtual machines and all the codes we have are reasonably portable we haven't found one that that will not port to the next uh version up uh, we had one tool where we played around with that for a while but then also these these older virtual machines have issues on security too so you have to be careful there as well right but um uh so as of now i think it's pretty much a a homogeneous uh, virtual machine backend, but in principle, it could be managed tool by tool. So, so that that is conceptually there, but in practice, I don't think we do it. But we we run some some of them are Windows, some of them are Linux. So, so in that sense, we have at least two flavors. So how hard is it to set this thing up? You're talking about virtual machines and making user interfaces for tools and you know VNC viewers and having the whole lamp stack up. Mm -hmm. how, like, what's the process? So, so there's there's two aspects to that, right? Let me from the from the let me take the second step first because that's what the more typical one is. Um, uh, let's assume you had a hub up and running. Somebody set it up for you. Uh, we we tend to create user interfaces and tools and pairs of graduate student, undergraduate student, faculty member, and um, and that takes some. Maybe for summer undergraduate students, we make those projects over a month and a half or so. Uh, they learn this Rapture toolkit and they they learn the science of the tool. And by the end of the summer, they they actually have a tool up and running that, after a while, can literally be used by thousands of people. And that assumes knowledge of Rapture, a little bit of Unix knowledge, um, and off we go. So it's basically a, a Unix machine running in your browser, and that's how they develop. Now, how to set up that whole framework out of box uh, is not necessarily simple. Um, we distribute Hub Zero as a um, overall virtual machine, so you can install this whole thing as a uh, as a virtual machine. But to install it for real uh, real infrastructure, you probably need a uh, at least a 1U unit that has some 8 or 16 cores, some, some hefty memory. Uh, you have to know about uh, virtual machines, etc. And uh, there's quite a bit of documentation that go, goes along with Hub Zero. But still, I think you sort of have to have um, uh, some serious uh, Unix and server knowledge to, to really set it up. So it's it's not necessarily a, a thing you just sort of do in an afternoon and just for the heck of it. So you, you kind of have to be dedicated to want to do that. Um, the alternative is um, and we have a couple of institutions that actually run their own hubs now. Um, uh, another model that we have done here at Purdue is uh, uh, this, this Hub Zero development group hosts hubs for entities. Uh, for Purdue entities and also for external entities on a sort of a subcontract um, that has happened. So those are the uh, the two models we have in a sense. We we host it, uh, or you can download the source and and uh, go at it. And those are the the two modes that are actively being pursued. Hosting like that's it's really quite neat, and the. Uh turnaround time to have a student understand and write an entire user interface for a scientific application in only a month is really impressive too you can have that going that fast yeah so, I, I actually really like it it's, it's pretty cool 
I mean, it's there's 235 tools or so on NanoHub. Again, we allow anybody to have any interface, like Qt or even MATLAB interfaces or whatever. I think about 220 or so use Rapture, um, and we don't indoctrinate it into people that they must do it. But it is pretty easy. But what about for power users? I mean, graphic user interfaces and stuff is what we've been talking about. What if I need to do like gigantic sweep, or you know, the the kind of standard HPC user of the old cloth, you could say. All right. So, what what we offer to the developers, not typically not to the end users, is um, basically uh, an application we call Workspace, and that Workspace is an instance of. Uh, uh, a Linux workstation that again runs in your browser and it has the whole software stack of NanoHub or Hub Zero installed. So it has also the whole grid computing capability and in the in the back end installed. So let's say you had code like let's pick one lamps like a molecular dynamics code, uh, which we also have in NanoHub, and we have um, uh, I believe some. Um, some instances also installed of uh, LAMPs on high-end computing systems. So you could, in principle, um, compose your input deck to LAMPs on this workspace and then uh, use our submit infrastructure to submit your input deck uh, with LAMPs to some compute resources. So it's a, it's a, a front-end to grid computing, even for the geek. Who, who knows what, what all these keywords are that I just mentioned. So could you give us a little more detail on, on Rapture? You know, how would I go about making um, my own tool? Do I need to link in certain things or do I just write any old GUI and it fits no. in afterwards? Or give us some examples so, of that. So all this info can actually be found on rapture.org. That's with two Ps, R-A-P-P-T-U-R-E dot O-R-G. It relinks to some page on NanoHub that explains it in some detail, and there's videos and podcasts on that as well. But but the gist of it is basically that um, you describe your input and output uh, through an XML descripting, uh, descriptor base. And... Um, uh, from the input description in this XML, it renders a GUI. We also have a little bit of a GUI builder that dumps out uh, the framework of the XML file for you so you don't have to do too many XML push-ups. Um, now, there's two ways to interface that GUI to your code. Um, the um, uh, probably the most uh, prevalent one is that people are in love uh, with their input language and their output files uh, as much as a, a mother is in love with their child. Uh, and and what they need, what they typically do is they write small scripted translators, either in Python or MATLAB or Perl or Tickle, um, to this uh, XML-based Rapture description. And there's APIs in Rapture to any of those scripting languages or C or C++ and Fortran where you can write those little translators. And uh, so you translate the uh, the Rapture input into your, say, gobbledygook uh, input deck or maybe extremely well-structured input deck for all that matter. Uh, you, the script then executes your code. Uh, you get some output files. And uh, then you have this script to transform these output files into uh, the XML-based uh, uh, file that Rapture likes to, or data object that Ra Rapture likes to get. And then, um, then it's all framed, right? Um, then basically, you have a workflow. Your script is a workflow. It does the GUI generation, the, the translation, the execution of the code or multiple codes if there's a sequence, and then the processing of the output. Uh, that's the typical way. So it's sort of like a wrapper around the science code you, you may not want to touch. But there's some scientists that also said, well, I actually I conjured up this input deck. I really don't like it all that much. I like Rapture as, a, as an I.O. handler and a database handler. And uh, I throw out my own I.O. and I, I just adopt in my C or Fortran or MATLAB code, I adopt the Rapture I.O. as a library, and then you don't have to write all these scripts anymore, these translation scripts. So there's two, two ways to go about it. 
So I want to shift a little bit here. We've been talking a lot about this submitting jobs to you know back end infrastructure using these you know nice easy to build GUI interfaces and such, which is kind of a unique thing to uh, the Nano Hub uh, Hub Zero kind of setup. What are some of the other things you can do on this thing? I mean, does it have all the traditional features of what we'd call a portal, places for storing documentation, collaboration across units, departments, colleges, what? Yeah, so so uh, the in in the web infrastructure we have a lot of these items that you just listed. So we have um for the tools more specifically, we have like question and answer for uh uh, we have wish lists uh, where people say this is a cool tool, but I wish I would do a, this thing, the next big thing. So there's exchange of ideas, and developers can jump on it, or people can join the development team. Um, then there is uh, group mechanisms where some people uh, aggregate information into groups, and these groups could be open, they could be by invitation only, or they could be completely hidden. Uh, so they can't be discovered. Um, these groups and, and and these tool pages are basically wiki type pages. They follow a wiki format, so they can be easily edited. And um, some professors now have their own group pages, even their home pages on NanoHub, because there's a lot of exposure to some 200,000 users that uh, roll by on NanoHub uh, each year. So, so they see that as an opportunity and as an easy way to edit their own group pages on NanoHub. So, so these collaborative uh, tools are there. Um, there's no chat, for example. There's no video chat, and um, in a sense, I, I feel there's a, a whole lot more that can be done. But we also then play catch up with standard um, other environments that that like. Google, for example, has wonderful collaboration environments. So, um, but it's very clear that users need it, and they would like to have it in one place. And then, and so we we strive to achieve some of that. So, how do people typically use the Hub Zero infrastructure? I mean, how do they organize their their information? Is it is it, do you typically see a lot of wiki use or, or documents that are uploaded or simulation? I mean, how do they, uh, I'm not even phrasing the question well, because it's, it's so open-ended, like just how do typical people typically use these hubs to actually collaborate? What information do they share? Right. So, so you're asking about the people that share which is in general quite uh, a small, uh, small amount of people compared to the ones that use. So, so we have some 3,000 content items or more on NanoHub, some 230 tools. So the tools are, I mean, distinct publications in a sense. They have digital object identifiers, they have authors, they stem out of a collaboration team. Um, then, uh, by far, the larger number of uh, content items are seminars and lectures or lectures in a classroom. Um, we have some, I think by now, 55 or 60 complete classes in nanotechnology that are videotaped and processed, so with PowerPoint slides, voiced over, etc., um, that uh, constitute content. There's some 800 authors now in total uh, on NanoHub. Um, 3,000 plus content items. Um, so that's typical ways of... Um, it's a publication venue, if you wish to look at it. At it. Uh, then some teachers uh, put together their course wikis, where they basically say, well... In the first week, we do this, uh, these exercises, and please run this tool, and etc. So they they almost build a syllabus uh, in in NanoHub. Uh, we did some of that for them, where we created something like a tool powered curricula. So it's a a one stop shop for faculty members and students to come to a particular, say, class for teaching semiconductor devices or for teaching quantum mechanics for engineers. So these are sort of aggregates. And then these uh, faculty members and students can buy into the aggregate, so to speak. Of course, it's free, so they don't really buy. It's a figurative buy. Um, so I think those... I would say um, 
the, the biggest gain we stand right now to see is uh, more people contributing more of the day-to-day -day usage components, like the, the files they might distribute to their students with their course layout or the, the uh, homework assignments, etc. So uh, that we don't see a whole lot. We see it a little bit. This this use for uh, Nano Hub or Hub Zero as a tool for education was this something that was expected from day one when you first built the collaboration environment? Um, yeah, we have. I mean, it stemmed out of research. So anecdotally, um, it was geared towards sharing a research tool with another research group. And enabling to use the tool without having to reinstall it or, as a matter of fact, to rewrite it on a PC because most experimentalists were on PCs and and didn't run Unix-type tools. So uh, so it stemmed out of research, but really early on, um, people realized, oh, I, you know, I have um, small tools or bigger tools or even circuit simulation tools that my students wouldn't have to install or my system admin doesn't have to install. And so let's use them in the classroom. And I don't have to, I can just go in the classroom and launch it and demo it in the class and show people how to access it. So, so the use in, 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 in formal education has been very evident early on. And I have kind of cool data to show now where I can really show that use and research and use in classroom um, overlap that you can't necessarily say a priori this is going to be a research tool or this is only a classroom tool. They overlap and I can show quantitatively how these tools are used in the classroom and they're being cited in the scientific literature. So the separation classroom versus research is really not a, not, not a good one. So this sounds like a, a tremendous service, particularly since it's free. And if I'm, you know, a given professor out there, I can just latch on to all this material that that's there. How do you do this for free? Because I mean, the the people and the equipment and the the, the bandwidth alone has got to be relatively expensive, or at least it's not free. You know, how do you how do you provide this for free? Right. So so the cute answer to that is it's it's free for the users. It's not. Uh, not free to me as the as the director or the the organization that hosts it and actually the funding agency that funds it so uh, the a agency that funds it it's the national science foundation that provides um, a, a very good grant to purdue and its affiliated universities that operate nanohub and fill it with content uh, um and it's not free to me because I have to continually prove that this infrastructure that we're building is actually useful and is being uh, worked used by people. So we do a lot of uh, studies to show that it's uh, uh, impactful and how it's impacting research and education, etc. That's why I know these assessment numbers, etc. So uh, we are now in year uh, 10 of a 10-year grant um, last October. Uh, there was a call for proposals to uh, reconfigure the NCN and NanoHub. Uh, we handed in a big proposal in January. Uh, this whole thing is uh, under review. Uh, there will be new content providers as well that is also under review by NSF. And I'm quite hopeful that uh, NanoHub, as some 200,000 users use it every year, uh, will continue in some shape or form for another five plus five, so ten years, uh, based on some organization that will win this grant, and there will be continuity. So, so I'm, I'm quite hopeful that that will be the case. So, how do you gate things? Um, you know, like the comp amount of consumed computation on the back end for these different works. I mean, you mentioned lamps. Lamps can consume a lot of CPU depending on what kind of simulation someone's trying to do. Mm -hmm. And then how do you gate, like, adding new tools to the public toolbox? You have over 300 now. How do you keep that from exploding into 13 copies of the same thing? Well, I mean, there's a couple of questions you have uh, in there, right? One is a matter of... Uh, how can you possibly uh, think of uh, providing enough resources um, in terms of compute cycles? 
Um, and there's two aspects to that. That's the front end, um, running the visual front ends and the GPUs that do some of the visualization. And then the back end that provides the cycles. So the, the high end compute cycles uh, we distribute um, are part of an, another NSF allocation on TerraGrid or Exceed as it's called now. Uh, so we can dispatch jobs into that queue. Um, or queuing system and uh, we haven't really pushed very much the very high end jobs either um, mostly because um, we want to make sure this whole grid infrastructure is actually working and working reliably etc uh, and there were some technical difficulties to overcome and we feel more and more comfortable that we have overcome them or can monitor them so so far we haven't run out of cycles um so that that's that's one aspect of 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 cycle provisioning uh the second one you mentioned is sort of tool quality control slash duplication control and in a sense uh, what we offer is a you can think of it as a tool publication venue right um where people feel that their tool should be on nano hub and they want to enable it and um, we now have people installing tools on NanoHub or, uh, that are not directly affiliated with us, meaning they have other NSF programs, they see benefit in disseminating the, their tools, and these tools that are created outside of the core unit of NCN and NanoHub are now also being used by yet a, a fourth, say, party for research. So we're starting to be a um like a dissemination venue for for other folks we're an infrastructure in terms of the suppliers and the users which is a kind of a cool thing in that we're actually kind of unregulated i mean the the thing that we demand from these tool developers are all right give us a paper a scientific peer-reviewed paper if it's a completely new tool or give us a decent reference of what the model is that is in this tool uh, please pr try to provide a first-time user guide to the tool and um, and stand by your tool if there are questions on the science components. Um, so those are the requirements we have towards tool developers. And yes, we actually have some tools that are sounding similar. They are running similar models, but you'll find that you know, there's different brands of cars, right? I mean... They all have four wheels and a steering wheel and a handbrake and, and all that stuff. But some people like one over the other. And um, I think that's a fair thing and it's a good thing. And then you can do performance metrics of one tool versus the next. And, um, and people have their personal preferences and they have their belief system of what's the better model. So we open that for people to, to utilize that. So how many uh, hubs does Purdue itself host? You, you mentioned that you guys do a lot of hosting, um, you know, internally and externally. Do you have any numbers on, on yeah. how many you guys host? It's, I mean, the, the exact numbers are, I think, on hubzero.org. But if I, I think we have a total of 40 hubs, and I think 12 or so are running outside. I'd, I'd have to go on the web and, and look right now, but th those are the ballpark numbers. So the majority, uh, we host for Purdue entities or on behalf of other entities. Now, is uh, NanoHub the biggest of those, would you say? I mean, that's kind of a subjective question, but... <laughs> well, it's the, certainly the biggest one in terms of number of users and, and, and call it market penetration and global use. Uh, there are other hubs like Global Hub, which is a collaborative engineering hub um, that has large numbers of users in the tens of thousands. Um, there's another very large hub project, uh, which is called Nice Hub. It's the um, uh, National Earthquake Engineering Infrastructure um, that is also NSF funded. It's a very large project, and they use uh, hubs to share uh, data of simulation, uh, data of physical experiments and also simulation tools that model these experiments. So 
so that's another very large project. Those are the two major very large projects, and then there's lots of smaller projects that utilize hubs. Do you have any kind of statistics on how many people outside of Purdue are hosting their own hubs? Yeah, so my, my gut feel, um, the, the, what I have in the back of my head is 12 or so, 12 fully operational outside hubs that are hosted not at Purdue. So there's all these hubs out there and other people using them. Um, what are some of the strange uses you've seen of Hub Zero? The strange uses? Um yeah, something like it wasn't originally, you never envisioned it being used for as. Oh, I see. Hmm. I, what I didn't expect to see, is, I mean, I expected it to be used for research and for education. Uh, what, I, what really surprises me is that um, how rapidly these um, former research tools migrate into the classroom. Um, so we, 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 we analyze usage patterns uh, of these tools and uh, do user-user correlations, and that's how we know when there's a cohort of people all showing up on Tuesday all using the same tool and roughly coming from the same IP pool, we know, aha, they, these guys are doing a, a homework assignment, right, or a project assignment. Um, and, and that's unique, say, to a, a certain tool. We can, and that might happen in many classes, but we can measure the time between the tool publication when 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 it showed up on the classroom uh, in the on NanoHub, and the time uh, it, it shows up for the first time in a classroom, which is sort of an adoption rate in a sense, right? Or use first time use um, uh, analysis, and uh, I mean, in a sense, you can think of these uh, tools as new textbooks, right? Or parts of textbooks, and, and a typical textbook takes some um, four years or so to to write. Um, so we have tools that show up within weeks in the classroom. So once they've once they're published, uh, they they show literally up a couple of tools show up within a week. Uh, some of them like uh, less than a month. Um, the on average, uh, sorry, uh, the medium time is less than six months. And you might say, well, these weak adopters, like they take a week to adopt, is probably the faculty member itself creating a tool for their class. That's true. But we also have, uh, we can prove now that there's outside adoption. And that starts about like within a month. People that didn't create a tool adopt a tool for their own class. So that that is so fast compared to four years of writing a textbook or something that was quite shocking to me that that was really surprising i would have thought it's a year or something but it's literally weeks to a few months and that's kind of cool that that was really surprising to me um i, I think that that would be the sort of the odd one i would say so as a software developer myself, I'm, I'm always curious uh, as to people who are writing other software. Um, I have two questions that I'd like to ask them just uh, for pure curiosity's sake. Uh, number one, what language um, did you guys write most of um, Hub Zero in? And, and number two, what type of version control system do you use for your code base and why? Okay, so so the, the standard front end... Um, is this uh, LAMPS business, right? So Linux, Apache, uh, MySQL, PHP. I forgot what the S is. Uh, so, so basically, the the front end is uh, PHP uh, in a close adoption to some Joomla um, uh, uh, content management system that we then extended out quite a bit. Um, so, so that's the web front end. Um, then the uh, the middleware that uh, cre manages virtual machines and, and uh, uh, grants access and, and all that that's uh, primarily written in Python. And sorry, what was the other question? Oh, the uh, revision control system. Yes. Yeah. So um, so so far uh, we've been using SVN, and we're moving towards Git. 
Ähm, not, Git seems to be more uh, general for us for multiple people working on projects with multiple permissions and that seems to be what I remember as what Michael McLennan, the, our software architect and sort of um, software genius of Hub Zero uh, identified um, but I'm not quite sure what the detailed difference is between SVN and Git. So what are some of the things coming for the future for Hub Zero? You mentioned you have a new proposal in. What kind of features and stuff do you want to see happen? Hey, cool question. That I think professors always like to talk about what they do in the future, right? So, so uh, yes, there, there's some cool things we envision doing. That is, um, we have now over 850 uh, citations in the literature that cite NanoHub usage, many of which sort of show uh, uh, NanoHub simulations that they have run and then maybe compared to experiments. Wouldn't it be cool if you actually read this in an interactive journal, say on your iPad, and you read this paper and you click on the graph and it goes back to the uh, the tool on NanoHub that ran this. Right, so so that would make uh, scientific results really duplicatable in a sense, and you can maybe then, if you're curious enough, compared to your own simulations, you can actually get the numerical data off. You don't have to scan the graph and try to guess data off of this graph. Um, so we want to embrace the the data storage of these simulation results and um, engage uh, publishers on scientific uh, communities like. Um, Institute of Physics and IEEE um, and um, and Springer, we have actually agreements with that we will have special issues where we will push these interactive journals, host the results, and then also start to manage some of the experimental data that is out there to, to compare that uh, to simulation results. So it's really uh, all about, um, everybody talks about big data, um, there's lots of small data to be handled, and so we think we have a way to to create user interfaces for this data browsing quite rapidly, and then allow people to um, uh, to foster this this notion that a, a good data set is like a publication, right? It's it may be just as valuable or even more valuable than the the paper that described it, so other people can utilize it. So. So that's one of the uh, the new aspects of um, of what what we're up to in in NanoHub and Hub Zero to 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 make interactive journals and to make scientific results reproducible. So, what's some of the contact information for uh, Hub Zero where people can find it, download it, and NanoHub? Oh, so so that's that's pretty easy. Uh, Hub Zero dot o r g. So H U B zero. C E Z E R O dot O R G. That's the the framework in a sense, um, and you find all kinds of uh, information on Hub Zero there. How many other hubs are running there? You, there's links to all the other hubs, and uh, Nano Hub is uh, Nano N A N A N A N O, and then Hub H U B dot O R G, and uh, you can find uh, contact information on there. Uh, and uh, I guess my name is Gerhard Klimek, and my uh, email is gecko, G-E-K-C-O, at purdue.edu. So you can send me email if you have questions as well. Um, that would be very welcomed. Okay. Th thank you again, Dr. Klimek. You're very welcome. Thanks again. This was great. All right. Wonderful.